way we feed a lantern to our feet, a light upon our path, and a strength to our lives. Take us and use us to love and serve all people in the power of the Holy Spirit. And in the name of your Son Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Today's reflection on the Passain passage demands us to consider a few important questions. What are the fear factors we come across that place us in hopeless context? Is there a hope and assurance for Muslim and Dalit? Christian Dalits to get a constitutional right. As a faith community, what is our response towards the untoward incidents that are taking place every day? In the light of these questions, the following assurance from this text is important. The assurance that is given by Jesus. Take courage, fear not. Take courage, fear not. There are certain things a human being has never been able to do much about, and the brother is one of them. We may talk about the brother. Complain about the weather, comment the weather, express hope for or against a certain kind of weather, and even we try to predict the weather, but we have never been able to do very much about the weather. We never even expected a rain, or all of a sudden there was a downpour. There are quite a number of strong stories in the Bible and several of them are in the Gospels. All of those strong stories are recorded in the Gospels involve the miracle of Jesus in calming storms. And in the Gospels, six accounts are found about stilling of storms by Jesus Christ. Actually, there are apparently only two events covered in four Gospels that show Jesus coming storms, but the two events are, are recorded three times each. First, the occasions when Jesus went with them in the boat, though he was asleep. This we find in Matthew chapter 8, 22 to 23 to 27. Mark chapter 4, 35 to 41, and Luke 8, 22 to 25. So if you carefully read these passages, you understand that the stories led to the conclusion that Jesus was an extraordinary man. Second, the occasion when Jesus was not with them in the boat. But this is recorded in Matthew, today's portion, Matthew 14, 22 following, Mark 6, 45 to 52, John 6, 16 to 21. The second set of stories led to the conclusion that Jesus was the Son of God. It is evident that a progression is intended in the two different episodes and that the second one provided for a great advance in the faith of Jesus' disciples. In our story today, Matthew, Mark and John all follow the feeding of the 5,000 with the story of Jesus walking on the water. And Matthew's version is most developed and includes the account of Peter also walking on the sea. The, the connection with 
the feeding of the five thousand suggests that Christological truths and kingdom truths are the purpose of Matthew's recording of this miracle. Of all the miracles of Jesus' ministry, this miracle is beyond the psychological or naturalistic explanation. Attempts in that direction have reduced this story to the status of comedy. Matthew's point is not simply that we are to respond in fascinated wonder and in a magical view. What this Jesus can walk on, water. He is also not. Rather, we should respond as the disciples do in verse 33. Truly, you are the Son of God. The confession of the disciples, truly you are the Son of God. And the echoes of the Old Testament scripture in this passage suggest that the point in this story is to be found in the relationship of Jesus and God. Structurally, this passage, Matthew 14, 22 to 33, contains two basic scenes. The first scene appears in verses 22 to 27. And the focus is on Jesus coming to his frightened disciples and speaking a word of peace and encouragement. The second scene occurs in verses 30, 28 to 33 and focuses on the dialogue between Jesus and Peter. The center that connects the two scenes is the statement of Jesus in verse 27. Have courage, it is I, do not be afraid. In the first scene, Jesus walks on the sea. Verses 25 and 26 describe Jesus as walking on the sea. We need to recognize that in the Old Testament, it was God, God alone who could stride across the sea. In many places in the Old Testament it is written, for example, Job 98, Psalm 77, 19, Isaiah 43, 16, and so on. So the point is clear. When the disciples saw Jesus walking on the water, the correct conclusion to draw is that Jesus was God himself. If this was not clear, verse 27 will make it clear. Jesus responds to the disciples' cry of fear by saying, Take courage. It is I. It is, it is I am. Fear not. His words echo the divine name, I am who I am, given to God in Exodus 3.14. The story of the walking on the water is designed to teach us the deity of Christ. However, it is also designed to teach us the practical application of that theological truth. If Christ is God, then his command, fear not, makes sense. And it is the only appropriate way for human beings to live our daily lives. In the second scene, Peter tells Jesus to call him onto the sea. The question here is, what should we make of Peter's request to walk on the sea and then his fearful response to the violent storm? Uh, some people might accuse Peter of putting Jesus to the test, of demanding Jesus prove who he is instead of keeping quiet and safe in the boat. Others might disagree and appreciate Peter's 
desire to walk where his Lord walks. The most important detail to consider in this place is the place Peter and his companions asked to go. If you read the previous particular page of the passage, the verses, after feeding the 5,000, Jesus made his disciples get into the boat and they were asked to go to the other side. It is not more than seven miles across when traveling east to west. Yet he and his companions apparently have spent nearly the whole night struggling to get across. They have not been able to go across for the storm has thrashed their boat. Now, as for the sea, in their worldview, in the worldview of the disciples, it represents chaos and danger. Then they think they see a ghost. It is terror all around. All night they have been threatened and water leaping up from its surroundings to pull down an entire boat. A ghost now interfering into the area of the living, perhaps to claim new victims. Disciples left to die at the mercy of the more powerful forces. Then they realize it is Jesus. Jesus walking over the watery chaos. So why would Peter want to go out there? I doubt Peter expects a walk on the sea will ease all his fears. No. Rather, his desire to join Jesus on the water expresses a desire for transcendence. He is not trying to be Jesus, but he is trying to be with him. He is trying to be with Jesus. Peter wants to share Jesus' unbounded place. He wants to put himself beyond expectations that determine our usual survival, whether for better or for worse. When Peter steps out of his boat, he enters a turmoil, chaos and confusion. His motive is not the escape from the boat. But he goes into a situation where the threats will now look different. He goes into a place where Jesus is challenging and reordering the chaotic situation. One of the reasons for the mass conversions that occurred throughout India during the modern missionary movement was the suffering the people faced in their life due to caste distinction. Their desire to join the church expresses a desire for transcendence. Not all of them were great believers, yet they wanted to go into a situation where the threats in the name of caste and gender will now look different. Because they knew that if God might be encountered anywhere, God will be found in places where the predictable endings don't apply as before. God breaks through to the incredibly chaotic places and the settings are reshaped where the poor receive support, the sick find comfort and the others enjoy dignity and freedom. Today's text opens the window to understand the continuing work of Jesus through the faith communities. The current events in India place a burden on communities of faith. The events stress the urgency of those communities regular calling to side with the needy. Churches cannot 
just watch compassionately or uh, lick the wounds inflicted by the social chaos fueled by casteism, sexual violence, ecological crisis, poverty, unemployment, illness and so on. The list goes on. It shows that we are living in a time of uncertainty and hopelessness. It is terror, fear and panic all around. The view from the board says churches are not prepared to make a difference in these areas. Why? Why? Because I suppose the theological institutions are not able to convince the churches to grasp any of our theological formulations made by reading the signs of the time. Looking at the given text for the reflection, the fear factor might be the same, but the context differs. The passage sets out clearly what is what the church is expected to do in this context, in this chaotic context. But today, neither are churches open, nor is the leadership fascinated in the formulations of theological foundations for the church's meaningful existence. This is because the church, in the process of its history, has turned into being more institutionalized and in the progression has lost its movement character as Jesus has envisioned. As it was informed in the beginning by the leader, our strength is being observed as a black day because the late Christians and Muslims are not protected as cats under Indian reservation policy. The Dalit Christians are the ancient indigenous people of this land, yet they have to struggle for their basic life as human beings. Reservation is available to Dalits who follow Hinduism, Buddhism and Sikhism. Dalits who convert to Christianity are no longer part of the affirmative action program run by the government. Therefore, most Dalit Christians who are economically poor, educationally backward, politically powerless and socially outcast have been deprived of their basic human rights. So it is not just enough to observe and celebrate the bad day, but communities of faith need to do something to bring Muslim and Christian Dalits under the ambit of constitutional safeguards. Not only this, a time as this, children are sexually abused, brutally killed, women beyond their age are under great threat. Every day we observe that women are being raped and find no solutions at all. Are we not challenged to address the threatening issues of context. The fear factor is the same, but the context differs. Whether the communities of faith devote resources for the empowerment and generously supporting programs with the same mission, it is risky, yet Christians voices in public realm will help and it should also be greater than now, more than ever, churches need to devote talents, resources and money to begin the harder work of imagining new ways forward, new beginning of what is possible. Theological institutions must read not only the science of the time, but read the science of the church in order to convince the church's meaningful existence. Many communities of faith actively already you know, seek local solutions through their own programs or in partnerships. There is no doubt about it. However, the view from the board says churches are not prepared to make 
a difference as expected. Part of religious devotion is participating in bringing such rearrangements into existence through service and cooperation. Our humble active little faith can foresee what possibility might be brought into being in this chaotic situation. Friends, today's reflection demands us to throw ourselves into a disorderly world and expect to encounter Jesus there. Because, as Peter discovered, Jesus is there where the boundaries are being redrawn. Extending life-giving stability when the chaos gets the upper hand. Take courage, fear not.